poverty. Poverty will keep us if we allow it. I'm talking about gentrification, being priced out, out of sight and out of mind. Neglected living conditions, lead, poor ventilation, water leaks, mold. We have the third oldest housing stock in the world. These homes lack efficiency, asbestos, poor insulation. Many are not up to cold and sit vacant, becoming an eyesore in areas of concentrated poverty and un unkept properties. Abandoned homes are an environmental hazard. The prison, the ACI is an environmental hazard. Poor living conditions and injustice. Next, we have from behind the walls, there's behind the walls, Anusha. Hi, my name's Anusha. I'm here organizing with Behind the Walls. And um, what we wanted to say is that you cannot thrive in a jail cell. You cannot thrive in a cage. And I'm gonna read a letter from somebody who's incarcerated in maximum security right now. He's been there since he was 19 years old. He's there for 35 years. And I think he explains better than anybody why prison abolition has to be part of a Thrive Agenda on the local and national level. Dear listener, my name is Zachary Alvarado, ID number 562543. I'm 25 years old and I am serving a 35 year prison sentence at the Maximum Security Prison in Cranston, Rhode Island. I have been in prison for about six years now and my experience here, here has been what someone would expect a prison to be like. Difficult, disgusting, vile, and sickening. There are many challenges one has to face in here, like watching your back not just from inmates but correctional officers as well. Another challenge is sanitation in an environment that has filth on top of filth. Mice and roaches roam the prison scavenging for any kind of food. Human bodily fluids left on the walls of the cells. Leaking toilets that leave fluids dripping down the walls of the cell beneath you. Rust stains that are all around the toilets, on the walls and on the desks that constantly stain your clothes and sheets. Mold in the corners of the walls and a constant stench of urine, mustiness, and other disgusting smells I will spare you the thought of. If only someone from the outside could see the conditions of these cells, specifically the prudences, they would know that there is a health hazard here. On top of having to worry about these issues mentioned above, there are more problems like getting the proper health treatment from mental health to physical. I personally have been diagnosed with PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, anxiety and depression. It took me a long time to get medication for these disorders. However, it was not until 2019 when I was able to get the proper medication to help me. Everything was going good until I ran out of my pills on December 28th, 2020. I requested for more pills that same day and was told they would be ordered and to come back the next day. But when I came back, they said they never ordered it. So every day I went to Medline, but still my pills were not being ordered. So I took my complaint to the lieutenant who told me he does not deal with medical issues. Then I went to the captain who told me that because of COVID, there has been a delay in medication being shipped to the ACI. I told him that this medication that I am on, I am not supposed to abruptly stop taking it or it could have negative effects on my mental health. He simply said, I'll have to wait. I wrote the warden about the issue and she forwarded my letter to the nursing supervisor who has yet to respond to me to this day, January 6, 2021. So I have had no medication since the 28th of December. I don't feel well, but I'm doing everything I can to not have an anxiety attack. I'm not the only one who has not received their medication. There are several others who are also waiting. During 2020, it was no surprise that the coronavirus would make it into this facility. From the very beginning, the correctional officers ignored social distancing amongst themselves as well as the inmates. Staff did not always keep their masks on and would cough and sneeze in the air and in inmates' cells when being searched, which was every single day. I saw correctional staff that obviously appeared to be sick still being allowed to work. However, there were increased penalties against the prisoners if they did not socially distance or properly wear their mask or pass an item to another person. These harsh penalties resulted in good time being taken away, longer segregation time, and quarantine was being used as a punishment tool. Recreation was shortened drastically to at times 30 minutes a day. And at, 
and once the facility issued tests, if somebody came back positive, there would be no recreation at all whatsoever. And but what that means is that people don't get out of their cells for more than 30 minutes a day. In intake right now, people aren't getting out for more than sometimes 48 hours, they don't leave their cells. Programs were cut or only being used through the mail. Mental health services were completely shut down. I reached out to mental health services multiple times and was ignored. Before COVID made it through the entire building, the ACI was testing staff and inmates once a week. If an inmate tested positive, they were then moved to a module that had the most COVID positive cases. I understood at that time that these cases, that these cases, um, that these tests were not 100% accurate. Um, I knew this because I witnessed an inmate test positive months before the virus made it into the facility and he was tested again, which resulted in a negative result. This happened to the same individual twice. So when the facility was moving people that tested positive to already infested blocks, I refused to take the test. I explained to the staff why I was refusing to take the test and I was placed on LFI, which means locked for investigation, and I was quarantined. I was not allowed to leave myself for anything, no phone call, no shower, nothing for 10 days until I ultimately took the test. I wrote the captain about the matter and how I felt I was being unfairly treated, not being allowed to take a shower or call my mother during a worldwide pandemic. He simply told me, locked in my cell until I took the test. Food was delivered to my cell during that time, but that was it. When someone is placed on quarantine, they are allowed to take a shower, make a phone call, and check the funds in their accounts. But because I would not comply with the test, I was denied the basic privilege to wash my body or call my loved one. 10 days. From November 23rd till December 2nd, I remained in my cell. By the time I took the test, the facility decided not to move anybody testing positive because it was in every block at that time. And just so if folks don't remember, Almost 100% of everybody in Maximum Facility got COVID in one month, in November, because they completely mismanaged it. It, it. Everybody got sick. At that point, the facility was placed on 23.5 hour lockdown, which meant we were only receiving 30 minutes of recreation a day. This lasted for 28 days, and on the 10th of December, I filed a grievance because two weeks into the lockdown, the DOC decided to open up the facility to a less restricted status for inmates who tested positive. Meanwhile, the ones who did not test positive, like myself, remained locked down. While I was locked down for not having the virus, inmates who had the virus were ordered to deliver our food to our cells. So COVID positives were delivering breakfast, lunch, and dinner to COVID negative cells. The morning I filed the grievance, that afternoon the building opened up for the COVID negative inmates. That meant that COVID negatives were forced to eat what stand next to and be around inmates who had the virus or still have it. Don't get me wrong, it was nice to get some fresh air, but now I felt like the DOC wanted me and the others to get sick. Nothing made sense. The deputy warden forwarded my grievance to the medical, but for what purpose? I don't know, medical never responded. I also wrote a letter to the mental health social worker, Lynn Ruel, on the same day I filed my grievance, but still have yet to get a response from her. Right now, I currently live in the Prudence 2 module, which holds 99 inmates. As I stated in the beginning of this letter, the cells are in deplorable conditions caked on rust stains on the walls. Most cells have mold growing on the ceiling and in the corner of the walls. There's plumbing issues with the toilets and it constantly stinks 24-7. The DOC was supposed to renovate these cells years ago after inmates were complaining. However, all they do is paint over the stains. No proper ventilation to combat the mold was ever installed and the cleaning supplies they give you does absolutely nothing. I wish the Department of Health would have someone come and look inside these cells, actually step inside the cells and tell me that the conditions are fine and safe. Since being in prison, I have acne all over my body. They swell up and then bleed. I have scars all over my back. The doctors tell me that it is some kind of fungus that they only see in here and they do not have an effective way of treating it. The majority of the public may not care about what goes on in prisons. And if most of them do hear about what happens here, they may say, who cares, they're criminals. All I could say is yes, I did some bad things that I deeply regret for so many reasons. I have scarred my victims for the rest of their lives and there's nothing I can do to take that back. All I can say is I am so sorry for what I did to them and to my family. I'm going to be here for a long time 
And while I'm here, I will work every day to be a better person so that when I come home, I can be a positive force in my community and give something back. This place can break a man's spirit with the things that are seen and have to be endured. Many people here just give up. Men that are going to be leaving here with hate in their hearts because of what this place does to you. When someone is actually treated like an animal, they may actually become that. So I would ask the public, don't you want people here who are getting out to be treated like human beings? Wouldn't you want these young men to be educated and not leave here with so much hate? How can a man focus in a wicked place like this? I have been judged by the courts and sentenced. I am now a ward of the state, but my incarceration feels like a battle. I have seen many give up and check out early, suicide. I have seen many become abused and just accept it because that is the culture here. Your life does not matter to the Rydock. As for my time here, I will continue to do all I can to be a better man regardless of what the DOC throws at me. My statements are true and honest and in no way fabricated. Thank you for hearing me. I do not wish to be anonymous. I give complete consent for this to be used. Zachary Alvarado, ID number 562543. So, I think it's obvious. You cannot have racial justice. You cannot have environmental justice. You can't have any kind of justice if people are living in these conditions abolition has to be part of this work and I also want to point out the fact that one in three Rhode Islanders have a record which means that one in three Rhode Islanders face barriers to housing and employment we can't talk about housing and employment access if we're not going to talk about that discrimination against people with records so the last thing I'm going to say is um, if you want to plug into this work and support some of the some of the work that's happening um, there's a bill that dare is working on with a lot of other folks with Senator Mack um, trying to reform the probation violation system so that people aren't being reincarcerated so easily. We're also working on a campaign to change these conditions at the ACI. We have a car rally every Sunday, three o'clock starting at the DMV. Please come out and show support. Folks inside can hear us. They hear us honking, they can see us. Please come out and show them that you're, you're here with them. Yes. Thank you. Thank you.